All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webcast today, Five Digital Practices to Drive Bank Customer Loyalty. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Answer Lab, I want to provide just some quick context for this presentation. Answer Lab is a user experience research firm with over 12 years focusing on digital experiences specifically. We have the privilege of working with many industry leading companies, helping them to envision new digital marketing opportunities, optimize existing ones, and measure their impact with user experience research. Your speaker today is Melody Payne. Melody is a senior UX researcher at Answer Lab where she's responsible for conducting qualitative research for leading brands such as Wells Fargo, Charles Schwab, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. She brings a great deal of financial services experience from both a product manager and a UX researcher perspective. A uh, quick housekeeping, if you have questions for Melody as we go through the webcast, go ahead and type them into the chat box or that question panel you probably see on your right-hand side. We'll address them at the end of the presentation, but feel free to add them at any point. Um, and then everyone attending will receive access to the event recording after the presentation. You'll get a follow-up email, so you'll have a chance to view again. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Melody. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to start by telling you what you can expect for the next 30 minutes or so, depending on how fast I talk. Uh, so I'll start by telling you why good UX is good business for consumer banking. Then I'm going to share five digital practices we've identified as having the most impact on improving bank customer loyalty. I'll go through some concrete examples for each of these practices and talk about how you might want to apply them. And then I will share a few practical suggestions for emphasizing the importance of good UX amongst your cross-functional team. And then we will have some time left over at the end to answer any questions that you have. All right. So why does the user experience of your financial services website or mobile app matter? We've been partnering with financial services companies for more than 12 years conducting customer research studies for a wide array of financial services firms from large banks to disruptors like Square and Venmo. And we've spoken to hundreds of bank consumers to understand their needs and wants and behavior. And we've seen firsthand how meeting the customer's most frequent needs with exceptional experiences, ones that exceed their expectations, turns lukewarm bank users into loyal and active bank customers. So how do you create those exceptional experiences? Well, Bain's research shows us that a back-to-basics approach pays off in the long run. And to quote their recent report, in everyday banking, delightful experiences are above all easy. And your users aren't just judging their experience of your digital tools against banks. Consumers expect banking experiences to be on par with other frequently used experiences they've grown accustomed to from industry leaders like Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And they also expect these experiences to be optimized for mobile devices so that they're easy to carry out anywhere, anytime. Bain's recent report also tells us that the battle is won or lost over routine interactions. So what does that mean? Well, consistently satisfying customers with frequently used functionality and prioritizing the convenience of mobile experiences helps move detractor customers and passive customers further up the net promoter score spectrum, which is, as you know, their likelihood to recommend your brand. And as their delight and loyalty grows, they increase usage of lucrative payment functions, opt into experience enhancements, such as aggregation services, credit score services, and ultimately think of their primary financial institution first when it comes time to open a new account. So this brings us to some of the digital practices we'd like to highlight today. Over the last few years, we've noticed many themes emerging amongst banking customers in the research that we conduct. And from these themes, we've identified five digital practices to help you focus your UX efforts on the improvements that have the most business impact. And these practices are listed here. You have to make it quick, communicate, make payments painless, aggregate, and simplify account opening. So now I'll begin to talk through each of these and provide some examples of design principles to help you implement these practices. 
So let's get started with the first digital practice, make it quick. You want to allow customers to access their account balances and perform key functions within seconds. So consumers are mostly in a hurry when conducting their routine banking tasks. They're getting more proficient with these activities on websites and mobile apps, oftentimes checking balances and making transfers and payments within seconds. So clear, quick access to the most frequently used functions supports this need to get in and get out quickly. So here are some examples of ways to accomplish this. So one way to make it quick is through expediting account access. Some novel ways that we've seen to bypass the often cumbersome task of inputting user IDs and passwords include one-touch fingerprint authentication for banking apps, which consumers now deem to be safe, reliable, and easy to use and also settings that permit the display of account balances and recent transactions when tapping the banking app icon, like the example we have depicted here, where user ID and password is not required until the user wants to transact or view some more history. In our research studies, we see consumers becoming more and more comfortable with conducting financial transactions on mobile devices, and we anticipate that this comfort level will continue to grow. They value quick and easy access to their accounts, you know, but they do still have significant concerns about the security of their financial information. So opt-in features like these, uh, which make their account access simple single tap from a mobile device, is a prudent strategy for improving their experience if that's something they want to do. So the design principle that we have highlighted here is just about minimizing the number of steps and interactions for the user to access their account information. Okay, um, up next we want to talk about customization, which is another way to speed up routine interactions for consumers. We've all had the experience of logging into our financial accounts and seeing a list of accounts displayed as long strings of numbers with balances and trying to decipher which account is which. So meaningful account nicknames speed up the process of recognizing accounts for users, which makes checking balances and conducting urgent transactions like transfers and payments even quicker and easier for them. Consumers value the ability to customize and label their online account information, and we hear regularly that account nicknames are a particularly helpful feature for account organization and management. But we've also heard some stories and complaints from users over time about how these customized names are not always identical in multiple channels. So consumers don't understand the system limitations that would create inconsistencies in the way this information is displayed on their mobile phone versus, say, at the ATM. Um, they expect these options to be identical across platforms, and supporting that expectation makes for a seamless, satisfying, and trustworthy experience for your users. So our principle here would be to support consistent customization across all your digital platforms. Another opportunity to speed things up for consumers is to place access to the most frequently used functions near balance information in digital platforms. So if space allows, such as in a tablet app like we have depicted here, place links and context with each account so that initiating common account management tasks becomes a no-brainer for the user. So our principle here would be to have clearly labeled high-frequency tasks and functions in plain view for quick access. So why is making it quick a win-win? Um, well, for the customer, you see an increased number of satisfied customers who can efficiently accomplish their tasks independently without customer support. And then for the business, you see increased digital platform usage, increased exposure to your digital marketing, and then decreased cost in customer support, such as your phone, your phone reps, and so forth. Okay, so let's move on to digital practice number two, which is communicate. So Suggestion here is to notify customers of potential problems in time for them to respond and make a difference. So as they say, timing is everything, even when it comes to managing finances. And consumers appreciate when their financial institutions alert them to situations likely to end in negative outcomes. 
like low balances, dropped credit scores, giving them a chance to respond in time to make a difference uh, really builds trust and wins loyalty. So let's go through a few examples of valuable ways to communicate. I'd like to start by talking about sending out automatic alerts. Um, and so few things upset consumers more than unforeseen fees and charges. And financial services providers can build trust by providing transparency through alerts and notifications that empower consumers to take control and make decisions they feel good about. So help your consumers track their balances by sending notifications if they have a low balance and are close to overdrawing an account and even allow them to opt into other reminders or automatic actions to transfer funds between accounts before they incur their fees. So when we say automatic here, we mean doing some of the thinking for the customer and sending those out without their request specifically, just knowing that you're meeting their needs. Another example is providing custom alerts. So consumers uh, rely on their smartphones to remind them of all kinds of important aspects of their lives, and finances is one of them. So if they have a financial goal, allow them to opt in to receiving push notifications, which inform them of the status of their goal, and motivate them to take action to improve their situation. So that's all true, but we also know that by the same token, customers need privacy when it comes to their finances. And you know, with your mobile phone, that's something that people can see when you're out in public. So we also suggest that you keep the primary alert content pretty high level, like our example here where the, draw, the withdrawal exceeding $100 um, information is actually being pushed, and then display the exact information less prominently. So if there's a deposit that came in, that amount of the deposit, or uh, whatever the information is that's being shared um, would be um, relegated to a lower level behind a login and more private. So the design principle here is just to allow customers to opt in to push notifications to meet their goals. And next I want to talk about alerts preferences. So we also know that customers need to feel in control when it comes to their finances. So meet those customer expectations for flexibility and choice when it comes to receiving alerts and notices from their financial institution. Allow them to control the frequency and the platform in which they're delivered. So for example, you know, turning your alerts on or off, like we have depicted here, just you know, with a with a switch, or um, setting specific custom thresholds for notifications. These types of options are things that customers really appreciate and help them feel in control of managing their own picture. So the principle here would be to give the customer control by allowing them to customize their alert delivery preferences. So why is communication a win-win? Well, for the customer, this informs them of important financial circumstances and helps them avoid negative outcomes, which ultimately builds trust in their bank. And for the business, this increased engagement with the customer allows for more touch points and more usage, and then provides you with a better understanding of how to market to customers' financial needs by monitoring and analyzing their behavior, by taking a look at what they want to know about, what they want to be alerted about. You have a better understanding of who they are and what they might be open to when you're making an offer. The next one is around payments, which is a, a big part of people's lives. And here, this digital practice number three is to make payments painless. We want to keep customers up to date with their payment obligations. So consumers realize that their creditworthiness is directly tied to how fully, promptly, consistently, and reliably they can make good on their promises to pay. So loan, mortgage, and credit card payments are top financial priorities in consumer budgets. And awareness of all notices and payment due dates is a goal that consumers have. So let's talk about payment reminders. 
most consumers do not automate the payments of all their household bills and expenses because they struggle with cash flow. So since they make a lot of one-time payments, it's easy for consumers to forget one. And providing reminders in context to raise awareness of due dates is really appreciated. So provide visual cues such as alert icons, advising consumers when to take necessary action, and also provide upcoming bills and due dates in a convenient location, such as maybe on their smartwatch. So the design principle here is really just to provide those helpful reminders to pay um, in context. And next, let's talk a little bit about payment messaging, which is sometimes that something that happens, not always, but it does. And although it's much easier to implement, important messaging is not as discoverable when inserted into a familiar UI because users focus on the form fields that they normally use. So when exceptions come up, like a misapplied a payment has happened or an additional payment is due, intercept the user to draw their attention away from their usual routine. Place the important details in focus, making them front and center before other actions and tasks can be completed. This will increase their chances of noticing the exception and handling it gracefully. This type of approach is not only effective for keeping customers on track, it also builds trust with customers by supporting your efforts to be really transparent. So our principle here would be to use splash screens instead of embedded messaging to draw immediate attention. So speaking of things like splash screens and getting customers' attention, we see many of our clients struggle with solving the user experience for customers who are in collections with payments. And based on several studies, we've collected a set of guiding principles to help customers make good on their payment obligations. And so I'll just go through those. And one is to be focused, so intercept the customer and bring attention to one topic. And then to keep it brief, place concise messaging in prominent locations. Then to be flexible, this is really important, to provide several payment options, allowing comparison even between the different options. And things like you can see in our screenshot here, like free form fields with amounts to pay that the, the customer can even invent. You also want to demonstrate empathy and provide contextual help and phone numbers um, to sort of support that possibility that someone will have a question or need some assistance with this important situation. And then, of course, you want to show gratitude by thanking and reassuring the customer after you actually take their payment. So combining consideration with brevity can effectively guide the user to make good on their financial commitments. And our principle here is just to follow some special guidelines for customers and collections. Okay, so why are painless payments a win-win? Well, for the customer, they receive helpful, clear warnings and reminders, and then they have the ability to make payments without making mistakes, and that increases their trust and satisfaction with the process. And for the business, um, you can help get customers in good standing with their payments, and therefore create opportunities for credit-worthy customers to increase their usage and also open new accounts with you. Okay, our fourth digital practice is aggregate. And we mean to make each customer's primary banking experience into a one-stop shop for their finances. So consumers are interested in maximizing the value of their login experiences in digital platforms by getting more complete status information at a glance across their entire financial life. And banks are uniquely positioned to provide enhancements like aggregation because customers log into their bank accounts more often than any other financial account. So options to consolidate account information across financial institutions, options like the one depicted here, have existed for over a decade on digital platforms. But the key is to let the customer decide just how much of their picture they want to focus on and where, and allow full or partial aggregation for customers so that they can easily design their own big picture. So for example, 
make it easy for them to pull in all of their credit card accounts that they're actively paying down, but maybe leave their mortgage account out of the picture if they have 25 years left to pay on it. Or allow them to monitor their education and savings account balances if their kids are in high school and college is around the corner, but then allow them to keep, say, a trust account that they can't access until a relative passes, you know, really out of sight and out of mind. That may be something they don't really want to think about or have front and center every time they look at their account. And we would um, advise that you do not continue to suggest that they add all their accounts unless you just see a new one that's coming into the picture and potentially identify that and say, would you like to add it, yes or no. So our design principle here would be to provide the option to consolidate account information across financial institutions. And next up is talking a little bit about personal financial management, which can be connected to um, aggregation. So in addition to providing a convenient view of account status, banks can educate consumers and increase their comprehension with tools and visualizations that make sense of their financial data. And they can do this by providing visibility into where money is being spent and doing the math for them. And they can also do this by allowing consumers to set financial goals and track their spending throughout the month against those goals. So um, when doing this, a couple of principles to keep in mind. One is to display progress against goals with simple graphs and charts that are easy for users to understand and identify immediately. And then also to automatically categorize and automatically tabulate expenses for users, really taking on a lot of that work. Next step is talking a little bit more about the credit score. So financial health, wealth, and well-being are all connected in consumers' minds. And a credit score is a basic, useful, important piece of information that all consumers can understand with pretty minimal explanation. But getting that score can be a mysterious and confusing process. And investing money and energy in learning about financial health is not very inspiring to consumers in general. However, banks can anticipate the consumer need to keep tabs on their score in a convenient place with one financial institution. And customers can see this financial institution as kind of a partner in crime, bringing them awareness and tips about how to improve their score. And this can build a deep level of loyalty and drive more frequent access and usage. So why is aggregating a win-win? Well, for the customer, uh, this creates increased awareness of their financial situation and contributes to improved financial standing over time. And then for the business, it really deepens loyalty uh, that customers have to their primary bank and makes them consider you for their next financial needs, such as a savings account, a credit card, a loan, a mortgage, even a retirement account, whatever it is that you offer, um, you'll be more likely to occur to them for that need. Okay, so our last digital practice that we want to highlight today is uh, number five here, simplify account opening. So what do we mean by that? Um, we mean simplifying the account research and application steps, which can accelerate the decision-making process without rushing the account opening process. Okay, so starting with account selection. You know, choosing an account can become a headache for customers when there are so many details to consider about each option. So displaying the important comparable facts like the APR or the mortgage rate very prominently in the experience and laid out in a sort of comparison table format. This builds trust with consumers and keeps them engaged in your content. But it also reduces the thinking on their part. And although you may want to tout every perk and disclose every gotcha for each option for all the accounts they are offering, consider that the user wants to make this decision as quickly as they can because let's face it, shopping for an account is not as much fun as shopping for a ring or a set of golf clubs. It's just not the kind of thing that um, consumers want to spend a lot of time doing. 
So our design principle here would be to provide key product comparison information in table format. And just to do that in plain view, you know, not through progressive disclosure, not through some other clever ways of hiding those key details, but just to have them displayed in plain view and easily comparable. And then remembering to think about mobile input. So consumers are increasingly more comfortable providing financial information on mobile devices. So just keep that in mind when designing account applications. If they've already been researching an account you offer from their mobile device, why not get them through the application form there as well? Um, an application form that's optimized for mobile increases the likelihood of consumers submitting it while they're on the go. So what do we mean by optimized for mobile? Well, not just formatting the content and input fields for the screen size, but remembering to leverage the native device functionality where it's appropriate, and even, for instance, surfacing the right keyboard, alpha or numeric, whichever is appropriate for the, for the input field where the user is. And I know you've probably had the experience, like we all have, where you know the alpha keypad comes up for number entry and you're on your mobile device, and that just makes it more cumbersome and frustrating to enter information quickly, no matter what you're doing. And so that kind of um, barrier can discourage you from continuing with the process. So the design principle would be to optimize forms for mobile with features such as number pads for entering digits and auto advance going from one field to the next. So now talking a little bit more about application progress, and I think this is something that a lot of people already believe in who are uh, in the industry here, but once users have gotten started with an application, can, you know, they can become frustrated when the process feels lengthier than expected. And I think we've all probably started an application of some kind and been a few pages in and not known how much more time we'd need to spend on the task. So to mitigate this uncertainty, Use those prominent visual cues, such as progress meters, um, to set expectations and minimize fatigue for the user. So the design principle here would just be to orient consumers throughout the application process by showing the steps along a progress bar. But what about partial completion? <laughs> so customers get interrupted while applying for accounts online. They also encounter moments when they need more time to gather the requested information because they're just not anticipating everything that's going to be asked of them during the process. So allow customers the option to save their application and return to it another time, but also encourage them to complete it by sending an email reminder in a few days and just be patient with them while they manage their way through this process, which is a very occasional task for customers, opening an account may not happen for a few years. So this is not something they're used to doing and in the habit of doing on a regular basis. They need some hand-holding and some um, clear disclosure of information, and they also need some reminders and some patience. So why is this a win-win? So for the customer, you know, removing the burden of overthinking account selection is a really big benefit, and then it helps shift their perception from being hard sold into just gathering information efficiently. And then for the business, you know, decreasing the number of site visits required before starting an online application by making all those factors that come into play with account selection just a little bit more straightforward for the user. And then also for with allowing them options like saving, it can increase your conversion of started applications. Okay, so just to recap, our five digital practices that we highlighted today were to make it quick, to communicate, to make payments painless, to aggregate, and to simplify account opening. So, you know, if you're watching this webcast, you already value user experience and you understand how it can improve your business. But in case you're still asked to justify its importance from time to time, I want to talk about some ways to demonstrate the value of incorporating UX insights into your project work and into your roadmap. So a good place to start is by looking at your metrics to identify problem areas and pausing to uncover the why behind them 
before assigning your valuable resources to particular UX improvements. So we're talking about validating your UX changes with business realities. And even though you know that what your, what your products are, you know them and you know your platforms really well, there can still be a lot of guesswork that comes up in a typical day. So if you notice that you have an increased abandonment rate on a particular screen, or you notice that usage has really dropped in a particular section of your secure platform, insert some exploratory user research into the process to uncover a valid explanation to the problem. And being able to validate that your UX roadmap is addressing real, specific problems which can be overcome with UX enhancements is a helpful way to justify your expenditures and make more accurate projections for what to expect after a solution is put into place. So another really effective approach um, is getting your project teams together to conduct empathy sessions with your design personas. So you probably all have design personas um, by now, and they may go by various different names like profiles or, um, you know, customer personas, UX personas. Um, but if there is a project plan to enhance a particular area of your site or launch a new product, a good way to start is to gather your subject matter experts together in a room and get them familiar with your design personas. So your line of business experts and your product marketing ex experts, for instance, can be paired on little teams and step through a task or an exercise that an end user would normally do with your content. And creating awareness of the user's experience really builds empathy and focus with your team, leading to more successful decision making on your project. Okay, and then another, um, another idea would be um, talking about pain point solution ideation with customer journey maps. So journey maps such as the journey from being a prospect to becoming a customer or even the journey of becoming a customer of another product or another feature have become valuable resources for designers and engineers as a way to capture all the activities and events that are encountered by users. So if you have a UX improvement in mind for any of the customer pain points identified along the journey, or maybe if you're stumped and unsure how to mitigate them, invite your designers, your system architects, and your product leaders to come together and examine these pain points and ideate on potential solutions and fixes. So brainstorming and collaboration with the people who have the most knowledge, ideas, and expertise can really lead to a clear roadmap that contains some quick wins, some short-term solutions, and then even longer-term evolutions of your product or your service. Okay, so I hope this has given you some new ways to think about prioritizing your UX enhancements and collaborating with the user at the center of your focus. And before we go into Q&A, I just wanted to show you where you can access more original content from Answer Lab. If you'd like to be informed when we launch something new, you can follow us on Twitter or sign up for our mailing list. And we do have some time for questions. Is there anything that I can address? If anyone has any questions that they want to add to the box on the side there, you can either use the chat directly to the host and panelists, or you can put them in the Q&A box. And I have, um, I have a mobile question for you, Melody, I think. Um, users are doing more on mobile. Is there a best practice for communicating security assurances? Um, is there a place where this is necessary? So communicating security assurances. Mm -hmm. So that can be done in a few different ways. One is through iconography. A lot of times users will notice, you know, things like lock icons and um, just areas visually that convey a feeling of security so that the user doesn't even really begin to think about it or question it. That's one sort of shortcut that's been um, utilized over time. And then also um, just providing uh, links either in menus behind like your main hamburger menu or something on the screen where the user can always click to get more information about exactly how their information is secure. Um, it's also helpful as long as that's not, you know, in the way 
Um, I think that I've seen some experiences where uh, we've tried to sort of hit people over the head with like a big announcement, and that can sometimes even like create some worry that might not have even been there um, by making it too prominent. So I would say um, subtle but obvious cues and um, contextual help would be probably your best strategies for that. Great. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I have a question about oh, where people want to complete tasks. Are there tasks people still only want to complete on a desktop um, that you've seen in your research? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about other industries where um, people but I think it, it does apply to financial services as well, where I hear people talking most often about um, wanting to be on their computer when they're looking for something new. If they're looking to purchase something they've never purchased before and they want to have easy access to a lot of related information, such as you know reviews or ratings from other customers, other people who have had experiences like they have, um, being able to look at big lengthy um, product comparison tables and a lot of text at once, or a lot of imagery at once. Um, I think so. I, I do think that the sort of browsing experience before you've decided what you want um, can be an area where the desktop is still uh, really appealing. But it also can really just depend on uh, a user's life. And if they're working all day in an office and they're near a desktop computer, they end up just kind of putting tasks into their life and fitting them in where it's most convenient for them. So they end up just maybe doing some banking or investing behaviors on the desktop because that's um, sort of their primary mode during the day. Um, whereas people who aren't doing that and are out and about all day, um, we see them starting to prefer to use their mobile device for almost everything possible. So there's a few factors there. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the box there. Does anyone have, um, if anyone else has a question, please put it in right now. Otherwise, I think we can we can wrap up. All right, I'm not seeing anything else come in. So I just want to say thanks to everyone for joining us today. And we will be following up with a link to the recording later on. And um, everyone, enjoy, enjoy your Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.